Welcome to the Real View podcast, where Ohio realtors connect you to innovators and influencers, keeping you with the real view of real estate. Whether you're a broker, agent, first time home buyer, industry leader, or just happen to stumble upon our podcast today, you can expect to hear tips, tools, tricks, interesting information, and so much more from the experts in Ohio's real estate game. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Real View Podcast. I am your host, Allison. Joining me today is a credit expert and entrepreneur. Todd Wilson. He has worked in our mortgage industry for many, many years. He is an expert on all things credit and mortgages and how to kind of navigate this world that is so important but does not get talked about enough. So I'm really excited to have him on the show today and to be talking about and breaking down this world of credit. So Todd, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining me. All right. Thank you for having me on, Allison. I really appreciate it. Yeah, super excited to be talking to you. And um, we've never discussed credit on this show before, and it's something that is so critical and important um, when it comes to buying and selling homes and mortgages and just the whole process. So really excited to be hearing from you and to be getting a little bit more insight into into this world and kind of how it affects our homeowners and our realtors. So, But before we get started on this topic, Todd, I have to ask our signature question that we ask all of the guests who join me on the podcast, which is since the podcast is called The Real View, I would like to know what is the best view that you have ever seen? I have to say when we took our kids to Hawaii, this is many, many years ago. I just remember being at the beach playing with my son. He was like maybe four and the waves are hitting us in the back. And my wife is She's getting a little anxious because she's like, the waves are going to seep away. I'm like, it's okay. I'm right here. I'm right here. <laughs> and he was just laughing the whole time, having a great time. Aww. Nothing worrying, worrying. And it's just, you know, Hawaii is beautiful. It was warm out. You know, it was, it was just a perfect day. Oh, I love that. Don't you wish we could live our lives that way now? Like if a wave comes and hits us, we don't even care. We just keep smiling and laughing because we know it's all going to be okay, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I love that. Um, thank you. Thanks for, for playing along on my, on my little signature question game. So Todd, I want to hear a little bit more about you and what you do, kind of um, your work in the industry, maybe how you got started. Tell us a little bit about you and, and, your, and your career. Well, I started in the mortgage industry in 2001. And the mortgage brokerage I was working for was doing a lot of subprime, but also some alt A for you know, those of us who have been around for a while. Alt A was that in between the subprime and the conventional loan. And then we also did some hard money. So we kind of dealt with everybody from A to D in terms of credit. I kind of learned a lot of stuff about credit as I was going along, but I didn't know as much as I thought I did. Because when 2008 hit, It's like the hammer dropped. That's when I really learned that I didn't know enough about credit because my income went to 20% of what it was a year before. I really just had nothing to back me up because I hadn't handled my credit properly. And so what happened was I ended up going through foreclosure, bankruptcy, basically lost everything and had to restart. And already having three kids at the time didn't make it very easy to do that. But my first decision was, that's it. Credit got me into trouble. I'm not going to use credit anymore. And so I didn't use credit for about three years. And then I started to realize how much it was holding me back because I couldn't buy a house. I couldn't buy a car. I couldn't even rent a car or get a hotel room without a lot of trouble. So I had to figure out how to get back into the credit game and not make the same mistakes I'd made before. I made phone calls to people I knew in the industry who also knew about credit. Most of them had no idea. And then finally, somebody said, hey, here's how to get your your first account when you haven't had any credit for a while and you've been through something horrible like that. I didn't think it was going to work, but I didn't have any other options. And really, I had nothing to lose. So I applied. And shockingly, I got approved. So I went, "Okay, I've got this one credit card. I'm just going to use it once a month, pay the bill when it comes, and then we'll see what happens. And after a few months, I checked my score. And it was actually higher than it had ever been before. And so at that point, I went, okay, there's a lot more I have to find out about this. Because as I said, you know, obviously I've been through this horrible situation and put my family into a horrible situation. So I had to avoid that. And so I did further research 
And as I was doing the research, some of the things I learned kind of opened my eyes. And one in particular was that there were 87 million Americans that had bad credit and another 45 million that had no credit score at all. And combining those two groups, that meant more than half the adult population had either bad credit or no credit. And when I discovered that, it changed from being about me making sure I didn't mess up my credit again to I have to help my clients and I have to help other people. And then ended up writing the book, Crack the Credit Code, because of that. That's crazy. So you kind of learned from your firsthand experience and kind of going through, you know, what you did with the crash in 08, you kind of had to rebuild yourself and learn all of this firsthand with the help, you know, of individuals you reached out to, um, as you were explaining. So you kind of, who better to know, you know, than you, someone who, who kind of experienced it firsthand. Let's talk about kind of just the, the basics. I think we should start kind of at the beginning. What exactly is credit and how does it work? And I know most of us who are listening to this podcast probably have some idea, you know, of it as we, as we work so much with our clients with credit and how that affects what kind of homes are able to purchase, as you alluded to. But let's start at the beginning. What is it and how does it work? Well, credit is basically the confidence that you're going to pay somebody back. If you have good credit, and you borrow money from somebody, they have a high level of confidence you're going to pay them back on the terms that were agreed to. If you have bad credit, then they don't have that same confidence. For example, if you borrow money from your parents and you say, hey, mom and dad, can I borrow 100 bucks because I'm going to buy X? And then you pay them back as agreed. Next time you go to borrow money from them, they've got a pretty good level of confidence you're going to pay them back. But if you didn't pay them back and you want to borrow money again later, they're going to say, hey, wait a minute you still owe us a hundred bucks. That's the very, very basic of what credit is. But of course, now we've got credit scores and you've got not just the credit scores, but the whole credit report. And there's just a lot that goes into it. So it's more than just one creditor having confidence you're going to pay them back because every creditor has a different viewpoint on how they're going to look at things. Yeah. And I'd love to hear a little bit more on how exactly do these creditors judge you and how do you get into the buildup of knowing whether you have bad or good credit. How does that kind of work? The first thing I always tell people to do is look at your credit report, see what's on there. And yeah, you can go to freecreditreport.com once a year and get the free credit report, but that doesn't really give you enough data. But you can go to Experian and to Equifax and you can get free accounts there so you can see what your credit report has on them. Now, I prefer Experian because it's more user-friendly. And TransUnion doesn't have a free report. They don't do anything for free. You have to pay them right out of the gate. But if you go to Experian, you can get a free account. You can see what your score is. It's not the score that's going to be pulled when you get a mortgage or a car loan or even a credit card, because there are oh, literally over 50 different credit scoring models. But it gives you an idea. And the more important thing is to see what is on the report. Then you can kind of see, okay, are my credit balances high? Have I had any payments? How many times has my credit been pulled? All those things kind of go into it. So that's the first thing is seeing what's on there. But then as far as how creditors look at it, the first thing you usually look at is the score. What is your score? Ideally, your score is 750 or above. But if it's not, it doesn't mean you're not going to get approved or you're going to have difficulty getting approved. Because depending on what you're buying, there are different tiers. For example, FHA lenders, they usually want a 620 credit score. But it is literally possible to get approved down to a 500 credit score with FHA as long as the lender will go that low. Most lenders won't. And most lenders go, nope, 620 is the cutoff. Others will go, well, we're better, we're different than everybody else. We'll get down to 580. But in actual fact, there are a few lenders who go down to 500. And one of the most important things to them is what is your mortgage history? Or if you're a renter, what is your rental history? Do you have every payment on time in the last year? Yeah, super important. Kind of there's a lot that goes into this scoring number and, and a lot of factors that go into this, right? Can you share a little bit more about some of those? I think you call them like the three critical scoring factors that kind of go into creating this number that we now see when it comes to our credit. Sure. There's actually five scoring factors. The first one is going to be your payment history, and that literally is how you pay your bills. And what they're looking for is not if something was late enough to get a late fee, because you know it could be 10, 15, 20 days, you get a late fee. 
but it has to be 30 days late for it to show up on your credit report and affect your credit score. So if you're the 29th of the month and you haven't paid that bill yet, it was due on the first, pay it now, even if you've got a late fee, because then it doesn't show up on your credit report. So that's number one is payment history. And they're, that's kind of broken up into three different things. I'll go over it really fast because we don't have a ton of time, but you've got number of lates, you know, so how frequent do you have late payments? And then how recent are your lates? Anything within the last six months is going to have the most effect. Anything from seven to 24 months is in the next group. And then over 24 months has the least effect. So you can see it, the older a late payment gets, the less effect it will have on your score. And that's one of the reasons why the credit repair companies aren't as successful as people really want them to be. Because the easier things to remove, of course, are the oldest ones and accounts that are closed. But if you had a late payment on a credit card, last month, they're not going to be able to get it removed. They say, well, look, we've removed 12 things from your report. And you look and you go, that's from 2017. That's making no difference on my score now anyway. And then the third thing is severity. How late is a late payment? Is it 30 days? Is it 90 days? Is it 150 days? And of course, the later it is, the more effect it's going to have. And your second biggest credit scoring factor is what is your credit usage? And this is not just on credit cards, but mostly it is on credit cards. It also affects your other accounts, but the only way you can really control it easily is through credit cards. Because if you have a car loan, let's say you took out a car loan two months ago and it was 20,000, now it's 19,800. Unless you're gonna put a chunk down on that, which is usually not, not in your plans. Otherwise, why would you borrow the 20,000 if you plan to only use 15, right? But on credit cards, you can control it. And the ideal number is to have no more than 30% usage. That doesn't mean that if you go to 31%, all of a sudden your credit score is going to drop 50 points because it doesn't work that way. Again, just like your, your late payments, it's a gradual scale. You know, it's like, okay, you know, 31% is better than 32%, but not as good as 30%. You know, but if you go over 50% usage, that's going to have a much bigger negative impact on your score. If you go over 100%, which yes, it's possible. But if you're at or above 100% usage, then it's going to be virtually impossible to get any credit from anybody, you know, unless it's a hard money loan. Any institutional type of lender is going to look at that and say, sorry, we can't do it. You know, it's going to affect your score. They're going to say, oh, you borrowed too much money. And logically, you think, well, if they gave me a $5,000 credit card, why would I be penalized for using $5,000 on it? But really what you should do, and I don't tell you any of this in school, but if you want to spend $5,000 on a credit card, get $20,000 available credit. Then you're using 25%. You're in the safe range. It's not going to affect your score negatively. You're just in a much better shape. And that's why you never hear you never want to max out a credit card, right? I mean, you've always heard that saying, but yeah, listening to you explain it in that way, that's why, right? That's why they say that. That's exactly right. Well, and it's not just you don't want to max it out. You don't even want to use half of it. Yeah, no, that's that's huge those are kind of the major factors or is there, is there any missing that we didn't touch on that we want to make sure? The three others, you know, there's mix of credit, which is quite literally what mix of credit types do you have? Mortgage, car loan, credit card, and there are other types. You have student loans, leases. You don't have to have all of them. If you don't have one, it doesn't mean, oh, well, I, I have to go out and get it because you can still have a good credit score even if you only have credit card or you only have credit card and mortgage. You don't have to go and buy a car just so you have a car loan. This episode of The Real View is brought to you by the Ohio Association of Community Colleges. Ohio's network of community colleges provides accessible training that accommodates the busy lifestyles of aspiring real estate professionals at half the price of a traditional university. With convenient locations in every part of the state, as well as online options, Ohio's community colleges are your smart choice for pre-licensing education. For more details or to start the journey to a real estate career, visit the education page at ohiorealtors.org and then click on the pre-licensed course locations. I want to talk a little bit about how credit becomes bad. You know, we touched a little bit on having a lot on credit cards and, you know, spending amounts that you're allocated to based off of your credit limits and things like that. But how does someone really get into bad credit and kind of what can we do to fix that? 
Well, the number one thing that causes bad credit is payment history. So if you have a late payment, if you can avoid late payments, that's obviously the best. But if you have late payments, get the accounts current, whatever you need to do. I mean, sometimes you might need to borrow money from a family member or a friend and then change your spending habits if you need to, or increase your income if you need to. Because sometimes we're in this industry, you know, the mortgage and real estate industry, where we hit a market like this, income is going to go down. You have to go, okay, well, let's prepare for that. Let's not spend more than we absolutely need to spend because we are a very consumer society. You see the ads on TV, the ads online, you get ads in your email, ads in your text now, buy this, buy this, buy this. It's very enticing, very attractively packaged products that are going to solve all your problems if you just spend the, the money on it, right? But if we can curb our spending, that is a huge step. I mean, especially during the holidays, everybody wants to spend far more than they can afford. I've been through it with my wife many Christmases, like, okay, let's have a budget and this is how much we want to spend. And it's hard because you, know, you want to give your kids everything that they want and more. But the truth is that they will be happier if you're not stressed out about money around them. <laughs> So true. I know. I think I saw something the other day online. It was like what not to do during the holidays. And like the number one thing was do not go into debt buying gifts. <laughs> Most importantly. Absolutely. And well, and another thing that can happen, and this is something that, you know, we don't necessarily think about when we're shopping, but you can have your credit card number stolen. If you shop with several different cards or use a, a debit card to shop online, I don't recommend using a debit card to shop online because that's attached to your money. And if somebody gets that card number, your money could all of a sudden be gone, depending on your bank. It take Maybe it's back in your account the next day. Maybe it's two weeks. You need groceries regardless of whether there's money in that account. Yeah. And a lot of times the process that it takes to actually get that money back is crazy and can take a long time. So that's a good, good bit of advice there too. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, and there's two other things about that that I like to say. One is if you're going to shop online, if at all possible, keep it to one card. You just use that one card online. You always monitor what's happening with it. And that way, if something does go wrong, all of a sudden you're like, hey, what's this $600 charge to some boot company in Texas that I've never heard of? And the reason I say that is because that actually happened to me a few years ago. Credit card company called me, hey, did you order $600 worth of boots from this women's boot store in Texas? I'm like, uh, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it, hap it happens a lot. I mean, I, I I think all of us listening, you know, have experienced it. I know I certainly have had charges come up and I'm like, what? I, I didn't buy that. I, you know, I think it's a very common thing that happens to more of us than I think maybe what we what we might think. Right. Well, and the next thing is some card companies will give you a virtual card number. So when you shop online, you can use that. And those are great because it's a one time use. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. More places should do that. I know, I've actually never heard of that. That's actually a very good idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know Capital One does because I got a Capital One card. And when you log into your account, it says, do you want to use a virtual credit card? And I was like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Great idea. I love that. One time use, never have to deal with it again. Yeah. No, no chance of fraud there, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I want to switch gears a little bit into, well, actually, no, I want to stay on this topic for a second because I want to hear more about what we can do to make our credit bad. If we do get into a situation where our number is low or, you know, we've had to max out a credit card due to, you know, whatever reason, how do we work to make that better? Okay. So there's actually a lot of stuff that goes into this. Obviously, we're not going to be able to hit all of the points, but number one is whatever you can do to pay down the debt. Number two is, whatever you need to do to get the payments current if they're not current, keep them, keep them current. And sometimes it's not a matter of not having the money, it's just a matter of organization. And so I set up all my credit cards to have the automatic payment for the minimum payment every month. So if I don't go in and log in and make a payment, I know at least my minimum payment is gonna be made. And that way I don't miss any payments, but I still log in every month to see every account to make sure okay, did the payment get received? And I like, I like that you said that, you know, that sometimes it's not even about the money's not there. It could be, but it maybe is just not in the right place. 
kind of just taking a look at everything and figuring out how how to get that number low. And I saw something on the news the other day, and it, I think it was yesterday, they said that, you know, with interest rates being the way that they are now, if someone has $1,000 of credit card debt, it would take them like nine years to pay off this credit card. Um, what are you seeing as far as how interest rates and things like that are impacting individuals who are maybe trying to pay down those credit cards or, or getting into a better place when it comes to their credit? Well, I think number one, it gives them an incentive to pay down the credit card debt because virtually every other type of loan has a fixed rate and a credit card is not fixed. It's variable. And every time the Fed decides to raise the prime rate, they just raised your credit card payments and they raise the amount that it's going to cost to pay those credit cards off. And so one thing I did a few years ago when we were in debt to a pretty large degree was I listed out all our credit cards in order of the interest rate. And so the highest interest rate gets paid first. You just knock knock that one out. Don't pay extra payments on the lower interest rate cards and just knock out one card at a time. And when that's knocked out, you focus on the next one and then the next one. Yep, absolutely. Is that kind of the biggest thing that when we take a look at improving the credit scores, would you say to focus on those on-time payments and then paying off the credit cards? Is that kind of the two biggest things? I would say yes. Those are definitely the two biggest things. Obviously, there's a lot more to do with it. You know, there's the whole planning ahead. Like, you know, if you do want to have, if you want to spend a certain amount on your credit card, you want to make sure you have enough available so that that's not going to negatively affect your score. But there's another little little uh, strategy you can use. I say little, but it's actually huge. When you get your credit card bill, like let's say it comes out on the last day of the month, that is usually the day it gets reported to the credit bureaus. So November 30th, if you had a balance of $2,000 on a card and it's a card that you use every month and you pay it off because you use it for all your business stuff, they're going to report that $2,000 limit to all the credit bureaus. So if you pay that off, on the 29th or the 28th, instead of waiting till the bill comes out, it gets reported as zero or zero plus whatever little charges came out in the couple of days between the date you paid it and the bill came out. That's so important. And I think something I I definitely was not aware of. So even just if you know when your statement's closing, just logging in a day or two before and making sure you know it's taken care of or, or you're making a payment on it can really impact when that when it's actually reported to those credit bureaus. I never knew that. That's that's very interesting and, and what a great idea to do, you know, when we're talking about all of this. There's so many things about credit, just the the nuances that you can't necessarily you can find them if you take a long time to look for them all. <laughs> it's it's kind of like being a real estate agent. People can go online and find some video on YouTube. Oh, I can do that. But you know, then you get into the business and you're like, okay, now what do I do now? And it takes years to put it all together and really know what you're doing. Yeah, no, it's it's so true. So, you know, uh, with your lengthy career in, in credit and mortgages in this industry, what has been most surprising that you've learned about credit and kind of how this all works? Most surprising? Wow, that's, that's a good question because <laughs> I haven't really thought about that at all. <laughs> I guess probably the most surprising thing to me was the number of people that had bad credit, even though income was not an issue. I literally saw this guy's credit report a couple of years ago, and it really just stuck out in my mind. This guy must have had 30 credit cards. It's not like his credit was horrible. He had no late payments, but he had so many accounts open that it was negatively affecting his credit score. And what was happening was every time this guy went into any store, this is the only way he could have possibly had all these cards. I mean, he had you know, Macy's and Target, and Walmart, the list goes on and on. But they said, hey, you can save 5% on today's purchases if you get this credit card. Well, how much are you really going to spend in one day at Target? Yeah. <laughs> Is it really worth a 5% discount? I mean, even if you spend $500 at Target, it's $25. And to have it affect your credit negatively, that can literally cost you thousands of dollars particularly if you're getting a mortgage or buying a car. It's crazy how bad or how quickly it can get bad, right? I mean, it can get bad fast, but if you do the right things, kind of stay on top of it. And I think too, it's good to to hear, you know, stories like you to know that if you are, if this is something that you're dealing with, you know, a, a poor credit score or, you know, a lot of credit card debt or whatever that may be, that there is ways to get out of it, right? And I think that is so important to know is that if you are in this place that you can climb your way out of it and 
become successful and still and not have that burden of a bad credit score or a bad credit card debt kind of holding you back. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. It's really key because a lot of people just kind of give up and they go, okay, I'm going to go for credit counseling or I'm going to do bankruptcy or I'm going to go for credit repair. The problems with those, those things bring to the table is credit repair usually doesn't work that well. And it, and it really does take a long time. And a lot of people who do credit repair do it again and again because they didn't learn what goes into their credit. They didn't learn how to actually control it. It's like if you got in a car wreck and they just gave you a new car, here you go. And there's no other penalty for it, you know? Yeah, it's like, well, I'll crash again. Who cares? <laughs> exactly. You didn't learn anything about how to prevent a car crash. Credit counseling, usually what happens is your credit gets destroyed. And they don't tell you that. They're managing it. and You're not dealing with the phone calls, but all these creditors are reporting that you're late. And then, of course, bankruptcy, we know. Yeah, hurts your credit for at least a couple of years, usually several. Yeah, so many, so many factors can go into it. Got to keep an eye on this one for sure. Todd, I kind of want to wrap up with a final question. Um, and we briefly touched on interest rates and, and, you know, what we've seen as far as those increasing the past few months. But what do you think the future of credit looks like? And we mentioned, you know, some of the numbers. There are so many adults who have bad or fair credit, another large amount of adults who have none at all. What does the future of credit look like, do you think? I'm a bit optimistic on this because I really think that credit education is going to take a step forward. I'm actually launching a whole business around it, not just speaking about it in my book, but actually putting together courses and seminars and getting people to the point where they fully understand it and they can be as professional on credit as they could be as a real estate agent or as an engineer and having that passed on to their kids. And I also want to get into the high schools and the colleges, because if you can learn something before you make all the mistakes, then you don't have to go through the pain that some of us have gone through to get where we are. Yeah. And this is something that should be taught in high school and, and in college. You know, I'm thinking like this should absolutely be a course as, you know, you're learning your home economics and, and things like that. I mean, this should be taught at such a young age before you're even eligible to buy a credit card because it's so important and it's so complex. And it's something that you're right. A lot of times, you know, as high schoolers, we are not taught this information. And this can be literally life-changing information. Yeah, I agree 100%. I, I hope to see more education on it. So that's very exciting. You see that need there because I think that that could be really important and something that we could all benefit from at a young age and even into our adult lives as well. There's just so much that goes into it. And, you know, I wish we had more time because I know there's so many more questions that I have and, and I'm curious about. Maybe we'll have to bring you on again um, in another time and have you back. Totally open to it. <laughs> but this was so amazing and eye-opening. And I know I learned a lot today too. And I know that our listeners will too. So I want to thank you for joining me and for sharing all of your knowledge with us today. Well, you're very welcome. Yeah, this was fantastic. And to all of our listeners for tuning in, we appreciate you guys and we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Real View. That wraps up today's episode. You can keep up with the latest on the podcast at ohiorealtors.org slash The Real View and on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Have questions, comments, or suggestions? We want to hear from you. Email us at podcast at ohiorealtors.org. We'll see you next time.